We're in Matthew chapter 5, doing a message series calling it Happy, because it's the beginning of the greatest speech of all time that Jesus gives called the Sermon on the Mount. And at the beginning, it's called the Beatitudes, and it's really for us to have a better attitude. That's what it's really all about. And it's so we, the, at the beginning of that are all these, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, which literally means happy are the, happy are the, happy are the. And it, you're going to be happier if you apply these to your life. But this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so we, he goes up on a mountainside, and he gathers the disciples closer, and then the crowds are standing by, listening in, eavesdropping in on the conversation that Jesus has happened with the disciples at the beginning, saying, like, this is totally counterintuitive to the culture. This is the upside-down kingdom of God. If, if you want to live for the kingdom of God, which is going to be totally opposite of the culture that you're in and that we're in, then do these things. And so we... we we are uh, going to pick up the action in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. So two weeks ago, my friend Bonnie, who's down here in the front row, and I got permission to do this. I said, I don't want to embarrass you this morning, but uh, there she is. She handed me a journal entry that she wrote uh, back in 1993. And she said, you know, I had some thoughts about this happy thing I wanted to share with you. I said, do you want this back? She said, no, I think it's photocopied. She put it in this nice little container. And, and I said, hey, this morning I asked her, put it on the spot, hey, can I share part of that journal entry with everybody? And she said, yes. So I'm like, yes, beginning illustration. I, yes, I get to do it. So, so here's, it. here's what she wrote up in the middle of her journal entry, 1993, January 1st. Um, she said, when I started reflecting on what happiness really is, happiness comes from the heart. I decided to get busy and concern myself with other people, and that's when I got happy. A kind word, a deed, a loving thought, interactions with loved ones and friends, being there to listen or laugh or cry, opening my eyes to all we do and, and to be happy about it. And just that, another day has dawned. Thankful for our health. God, thank you. Signed, Bonnie, January 1st, 1993. Thank you for sharing that with me and to share it with everybody else. Uh, and I just thought that was great perspective. I mean, that's it. That's it. And so for, you know, her, for her to thank God at the end of this whole thing and, and write it down, which who does that today? To write down a, a journal. Anybody know what a journal is? I mean, to, to write that down and, and to archive it, to be able to hand it on to, 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 well, a pastor or family members down the road. I mean, it's just beautiful. Well, what I didn't share ahead of that is she was struggling with ha that, that day and walking through it, and she made a conscious decision earlier that day to, to walk and look for happiness in the world. She wasn't finding it in a lot of places, and so she came home and, and said, you know what, I'm going to make a decision today that I'm going to be happy about this whole thing. That's what this is all about. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says this, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, which was covered last week. And then today, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. So right out of the gate, let me tell you what mercy is. Mercy is when you blow it and you don't get punished for it. It's when you blow it, you make a mistake, and you don't get what's coming to you. You don't get the punishment that comes. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. It's super important. This is the center of the gospel of Jesus Christ is mercy, and another word we'll get to later, grace. But mercy, it's like you're not getting what you deserve. So we got to drill down on this a little bit. It's, it's my wife. I got permission for this one too, by the way. It's my wife, Lori, speeding, just hypothetically, speeding <laughs> and being pulled over by a police officer. And they come up and, they, you know, and they, she doesn't get a ticket. She doesn't get a ticket. That's mercy. She deserved a ticket. She sped. I mean, I'm just picking on her. It could have been me. Uh, but the police officer, but, I, but I, I didn't get mercy when, it, when that happens to me. I don't get mercy. But she does. She gets mercy for some reason, and she doesn't get the ticket. That, that's that. Now, grace, on the other hand, is when you get what you don't deserve. Well, you get what you don't deserve. So it would be like this. It would be, it'd be Lori speeding, being pulled over by a police officer. The police officer comes up, does not give her the ticket, even though she deserves it, mercy. But then he hands her an ice cream cone. She didn't deserve that either. That's grace. Like you get what you didn't deserve. Like you should have been punished, but you get something in exchange. There's where mercy and grace go together. 
This morning we're going to talk about mercy. Mercy, mercy is, this, is this beautiful combination of love, sympathy, help, forgiveness, full of pity and compassion, jam-packed into this word mercy. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, it is loaded with meaning and, and context, because Jesus is drawing the, the, the crowd uh, up to them on the Sea of Galilee, and they're bringing the disciples close. Do you guys want to be a part of this kingdom thing? You, you want to really follow me around for the next three years, you know, a place to lay your head? It's going to be hard. You really want to be a part of that? Then you're going to have to reverse everything, because the culture that's around the disciples in that day was not merciful. It was not merciful then. I'm not even talking about today. I'm just talking about then. It was not merciful. So when he says that, it's not like blow past that statement. They're like, what? What are you talking about? Mercy, show mercy to people. Because here's the background. Think about it. You got the Romans. The Romans didn't show any mercy to anyone. The Romans torture people. The Romans were all about power. We're in full control. I mean, everybody submit to us. Respect us. We will punish you if you don't. In horrific and terrible ways, as you know from Jesus dying on a cross. Flogging and I mean, brutal, no mercy from the Romans. But on the other hand, the religious Pharisees, there's no mercy there either because they, they're all about the law. And if you don't live up to the law and look the right way and dress the right way and say prayers the right way and be very religious on the outside, if you don't do the right, they don't, they're not about mercy. They're about aligned to this religious culture. So all around these, these disciples who are from these ragtag group of guys who are from all over walks of life, getting close to Jesus on this mountainside, he shares right out of the gate, you guys need to be merciful or you're not going to get any mercy. Would have been totally counterintuitive to them, and it probably is to us. Uh, it really probably is. And so how do we get this? How do we understand mercy? I just have two points today. Number one is see how much you need mercy. See how much you need mercy. You got to start there. I mean, do you understand how much you personally need mercy? Like, like because you got to drill down further and go, what, then what is mercy? And we got to define it. We got to figure out what this is. Because if you don't understand how much you need mercy, then there's no way you're going to extend mercy to somebody else. Because you don't fully understand it. So, so do you understand fully how much you need mercy more than your spouse or your kids for sitting next to you? Uh, somebody's in your mind right now like, man, they need mercy. But you know, think about you. How much do you need mercy today? Not your friend, coworker, neighbor, you. Because mercy is not getting what you deserve. Well, what do you deserve? Let's drill down, friends. What do you deserve? You got to understand this word guilt. And the only way to understand guilt is to understand this other word called sin. And if you don't understand that, that we all missed the mark, we all fall short of the glory of God, we've all made mistakes that don't just go against a person but go against God, then you're not going to understand mercy. If you don't understand that, man, you, you, we, we've all probably experienced to some degree hell on earth. You ever experienced that before? Like you're going through something really, really hard, a loss of a job, a divorce, a child sickness or death or a, a difficult injury or, or surgery or a broken relationship or something that's really, really hard and it feels like, and you hear the phrase out there in the world, like this is hell on earth right now. And you've experienced that, but what about this? What about this? Because of our sin, because of a, how far short we fall from God in little and big ways, depending on how you define it, you, you, you're not deserving of mercy. What do you really deserve? Well, you deserve to go to a place called hell for all of eternity. That's what you deserve. So you're not going to understand mercy unless you understand that. So it got a little heavy this morning, didn't it? So if you don't understand, man, man let, me, let me just drill down a little bit further. Have you ever lied before about anything to any degree? You, this, then you don't have to shout out, yeah, you don't do, do that. No, no. Have you ever stolen anything? Even something small? I was, uh, some of you know, I'm a volunteer uh, chaplain for the Lakewood Police Department, and to, to get to that spot, I had to go through more of the gauntlet uh, than I ever did to be a pastor, and one of the things I had to do was a polygraph test, uh, just to be a volunteer. 
Uh, and if so, but you got to get all these clearances. So it was all stuff. And it's like crazy. So everybody can trust you. And so I had to sit there and do that. And that was, it was just like the movies. It was unbelievable. It was sit there, strapped up, everything around. You're already nervous now. It's like, I don't know if I say that right or is it, am I sweating enough? You know, you're, you're starting to second guess everything. It's all videotaped right there. And the guy leaves the room and comes back and leaves the room and comes back and he asks questions behind it. it it's a little nerve wracking to give a polygraph test. And here's the deal. He came back at the end and he goes, everything's clear, but there's just one thing I just want to drill down. And I'm like, oh, what, what did I say? And he goes, um, have you ever taken anything? You ever, you ever taken anything that's not yours? You know, what do you, I, pff, no, I haven't taken a car or stolen a car or a computer or anything. It's like, even like pens, even pens from a workplace. I'm like, what came up on the polygraph test for me to c- come through on that for him to ask that? I have no idea. But I'm like, well, yeah, probably. If I took a pen from the church or something. But that somehow did something in the polygraph test that made me look guilty. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it was stealing, but, it was, but I took something that made me look guilty. Have you ever done that before? Ever hurt a person with your words or your actions? Ever, ever lusted? Looked at a woman appropriately or man? Ever looked at pornography before? Ever been selfish? Ever been prideful? Ever love, love, not love something that you know you should have loved more? Ever done something you know you should have done better? All those things, friends, are just a few categories of what the Bible would call sin that makes us fall short, that doesn't deserve any mercy at all. We deserve to be punished for it. And if you don't fully get that, you're not going to understand when Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful. They're being given mercy if they, if they send it to somebody else. I mean, you're not going to fully get that because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the Bible says. And, and everything inside of us, though, wants to wrestle and go, but, but it wasn't that bad. It wasn't, you know, but, but what about that person? What about them? Man, they, do you know what they did, though? That's what we want to do rather than, no, 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 drill down on you. You, you know, hey, I, me. Yes, I'm guilty. So if you you got to understand guilty because of that before God. I don't deserve any mercy at all. I deserve punishment. Man, to not get punishment forever is the greatest majestic mercy gift of all time. And that's why Jesus came to eventually die on a cross with the forgiveness of sins and rise from the grave because, because he's extending mercy as part of the equation towards us. Where if we just believe in him, then we'll be saved. And when, then we, when you fully get mercy, so, so Jesus knows that these disciples are going to be with him for a while. And, and so he, he tells stories and he has real life encounters with people to demonstrate and say things around mercy all over the place. You ever seen it before? Ever read it before? Let me give you a few. I mean, there, there are these blind beggars that are standing by. And they're, they're begging. And let me just read the story uh, further down the road in Matthew chapter 20, starting verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him because he's picked up speed now and people are getting free meals and seeing fireworks shows, so they want to follow. And, and two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, listen to what they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. They're just declaring it right there. And the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of God, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. And Lord, they answer, we want our sight. And Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. I mean, first of all, how did, how did they know Jesus was passing by? They're blind. Somebody told them. Somebody had heard about Jesus. Somebody was following Jesus. Somebody was, was not with Jesus at the moment, but they, they saw Jesus coming by. There he is. There's that guy. There's the guy that they been prophesied about or it declares, it might be the Messiah, might be the rescuer from Rome and all this stuff. They misinterpret everything. But, but these blind men, they'd heard the stories. They'd been sitting by. They, they're blind. They can't see anything, but they, they've heard the stories about Jesus and somehow the, the Holy Spirit touched their lives because they got who Jesus was. So they yell out, you know, son, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Well, that Son of David title has everything to do with a, an awaited deliverer, the one to be prophesied about. Now, they probably didn't 100% get it, the whole thing, but they got enough to go, this is the guy. 
and they haven't even seen him. They just heard about him. And then God, probably through the power of his Holy Spirit, like helped them get it. So they're standing by, they're yelling out, have mercy on us. And what's the crowd's reaction? Shh, you guys, you make, shh, you're making a scene. So what do they do? They yell louder because <laughs> they got it. Like, Lord, have mercy, son of David, have mercy on us. And then it gets really, really weird. Because <laughs> Jesus, you know, crowd, you don't get it. Invite them over. He goes over to them, and they come to him, and, and they have this interaction. And, and Jesus, what, what is this, trick question, Jesus? Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? They could have asked for anything. Think about it. Give me the next number to the lotto ticket to win it all. They, they, could, have, they could have asked for anything. But they said, no, we want our sight. And I think the whole point of this whole story is for all of us to get our sight. I think it's Jesus using this physical sight thing with these two guys. He literally heals and they get their sight back to show everybody else like who Jesus gets so they can see Jesus. They can literally see him. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And these blind guys have to yell it out before they even see him for us to see him. You get it? I mean, I think that's the, I think that's the deal. And, and, and they understood they needed mercy. They could have yelled out. They could have said, I want a thousand shekels, <laughs> which only is $274. But, but they, oh, they could ask for anything. But, but they, they asked for their sight because Jesus showed them mercy to give it. They don't, maybe, maybe they were guilty. I don't know. Oftentimes it's not true that, you know, there's any sin in that person's life that's causing them to have a physical thing. But maybe they were. I don't know. We don't know. But, but, they did, but they didn't deserve mercy, but Jesus extended mercy to them. Do you see yourself in these blind beggars asking for mercy? Have you ever called out loudly to Jesus saying, man, would you just rescue me from that? Show me mercy. I need mercy because I'm guilty. I recognize my sin and I need your mercy. There's nothing I'm going to be able to do to work for it or to work it off or do anything that's going to help that. You, I need you, Jesus, to extend mercy my way. I was on a drive back to college when I was in my 20s. The college I went to in Michigan was an hour away from the town I grew up in. And so I was home probably doing laundry or something and drove back on a wintry road in Michigan. And it was a two-lane road uh, heading that direction. And, and I lost control of the car. I saw, I remember seeing another car coming the opposite way, just two-lane, country road, lost control. I did a 360. Uh, that car somehow missed me. I don't know how. I don't know if it was before or after him. I just it was like, you see it, 360, he's out of your view now. Into a snowbank, boom, I'm in the whole car. And this is back before cell phones. And it's a country road with farmhouses. And, and I had to get the door open through the snow I step out like snow at least as deep as off the stage, step down into snow, and I'm just like, oh, great. <laughs> I get to walk down the road. I get to knock on the door, ask whoever's there, and hope somebody's there to call dad. So I get to get on the phone and call dad and not know what his reaction is going to be. I don't know why I'm emotional right now, <laughs> uh, but call dad and course you know you okay you know, okay and then next next is uh coming to get you he showed mercy as i recall i i through some work and through his help i, I got another car it was mercy i deserve to be punished and you can say well it's an accident da, 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 it's fun around but but, but but you know but i, I probably probably shouldn't have deserved mercy probably should have deserved some kind of punishment. Like you can't do something, I don't know. I'm in college. I'm an adult now. And he showed mercy towards me. Do you see how much you need mercy? Man, if you don't, you're not going to catch this next part. So don't even pay attention. How many times have you heard a pastor say that? Don't pay attention to the last half of the sermon unless you get the first part. You ready for the second part? Some of you are. Number two, is, is you need to see people in God's image who need mercy. You need to see people in God's image who need mercy because everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone. 
everyone. So, so go ahead and just tell the person next to you right now, you're made in the image of God. <laughs> yeah, you, you are. Uh, I don't know how hard that was for you to say to that person next to you. Look at me now so you don't get in trouble. Okay, good. Um, but, you know, every single person is made in the image of God. Now, let me, let me get close to home. If that first part wasn't close to home, maybe this part is going to get closer to home. Watch this. Even the person who can't relate, you re- can't relate to, who you can't understand, who differs in their theology, who has a different worldview, who's totally different from you, made in the image of God. The person who, with a, with a different sexual orientation, a different political view, a different skin color, a different citizenship, they are made in the image of God. They deserve mercy. They deserve, they, they should get mercy. They don't deserve mercy. They should get it, though. And the person who does not look like you or smell like you or act like you or dress like you, everyone is made in the image of God. Do you understand that? you understand that? If you don't understand that, you're not going to get this. You're not going to get what Jesus is saying in this beatitude. Not just the poor or the struggling or the lost, but followers of Jesus are made in the image of God. (laughs) You know, because sometimes the, the greatest tension happens inside the church rather than outside the church. And some of the greatest tension on social media happens among Christians. And not with among out there in the world. It's crazy. But, but this is why, this is why we need God's mercy, believers in Jesus, every day. That's why Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, which I know you have memorized, says, you, know, you really do, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. That's who they are. Great is your faithfulness. I mean, that, that, that's why every single one of us, because we're made in the image of God, deserve his mercy no matter how, how bad it is, no matter how different you are from them. Here's a jaw-dropping story of Jesus a little bit before Matthew chapter 20, verse, verse 18. He says this, it, it's, it's the story of the, what's called the unmerciful debtor. In uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, Jesus tells this story. Listen closely. See if you find yourself in the story. Therefore, and whenever you see therefore, you stop and see what it's there for, right? But we're not going to. We're going to keep going. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he began to the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. That's a bunch of money. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell at his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Unbelievable mercy. Verse 28, but when he, the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, way lower than the ten bags of gold. And he grabbed him and began to choke him, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his, ser- his fellow servant fell at his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Well, how is he going to do that in prison? When the, the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant back in and called him, you wicked servant. I canceled all your debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant, uh, uh, fe- uh, servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he had paid back everything he owed. Now watch, here's the kicker verse, everybody, that's not going to sit comfortably with everyone. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Woo! That's Jesus, everybody. That's Jesus saying that to the crowds and the disciples and saying, you guys fully didn't get that mercy thing back there in the greatest speech of all time. Now I'm going to tell you a story maybe a year or two later to remind you of what mercy is all about. I mean, can you believe that that guy wouldn't extend mercy to other people? Can you believe that he would, like, uh, 10 bags of gold, gone, debt gone. 
And then he goes to his servant and, and, and does all that to him. Can you believe that he would ever do that? Or is that like us? And I think that's the point. I think Jesus is saying, man, that, this gets really, really close to home. Because if you don't understand how much you need mercy, there's no way you're going to extend it to someone else who, who doesn't even deserve it, but you give it anyway. I mean, it's unbelievable, these stories that Jesus just layers on top of layers on top of layers, and we don't stop and pause and go, man, that gets close to home, because there's probably people in your life and in my life who, who it's really hard to extend mercy their way. Do you know what they've done to me? Do you know what they've said to me? Do you know all that stuff? And, and the only way you're going to get this, you're going to extend mercy to somebody else, is because you understand how much mercy has been extended to you through Jesus. If you don't understand that, this is going to be really, really hard for you. But for some of you, it's still hard for you. And you've been given that mercy because he died on the cross for you. And you, you know he rose from the grave. But you're having a really, really hard time in your own life with people around you extending mercy to them. You need to go spend more time with Jesus. You really do. I mean, the apostle Paul would write to the churches, and I say to River Church, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. Or he goes on in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, to another church, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. There it is again. Like you're not, and, and forgiveness, grace, mercy, all that layered together. If you don't fully get that, then you're not going to extend it to somebody else. But if you do get that, it's a lot easier. It's like, are you kidding me? I know how bad I was till I got that mercy. Now, how, how can I not extend it? Because you know how great it was that Jesus did that for me? So how can I not extend it? So how much did the Lord forgive you, show mercy towards you? How much mercy has the Lord Jesus extended your way? I mean, how, 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 do, you, how, how do you need to extend mercy to someone else today? Man. See, listen, th this, this beatitude is kind of the middle space. I'm calling it the middle space beatitude. Because it's an if-then, it's a this-that, that. If you do this, th this happens. It, it's this in between. It, you know, blessed are the merciful, for they will extend mercy. You know, if they extend to other, some other some other person. So it's like this. I mean, just picture this. It's like if I've been extended mercy from Jesus and what He's done for me on the cross, and if I fully get that, I fully I've surrendered. I fully get how much mercy He's given me, even though I didn't deserve it. Just mercy. I'm not even talking about grace. But just mercy, I received it from him. I get that. It's like, man, yeah, you, you saved me. I didn't deserve that. I was a wreck. But you, you did that to me. Now I get to go extend it to others. If you, if you don't get this part, it's going to be really hard to do this. But when you get this part, how much mercy I've gotten from him, man, it might be really, really hard. But that is the greatest gift of all time. So why wouldn't I extend that to everybody else? Why wouldn't I do that? Now, I know he's still working on all of us, and, and this, is, this is why it's the middle space, but this, this beatitude has some good conditions. So, so just listen to this for a second. I'm, I'm using my imagination. I've, I've thought this through with some commentaries and other people are a lot smarter than I am about this, but listen to this. When, when God asks us for a record of our mercy on Judgment Day, I mean, what's that going to look like? It, it's not going to be a punched card. It's not going to be you put in eight hours of mercy work in this week, check it off the list, out of duty. Here, God, here's my punch card. It's not going to look like that. It's going to be more like your medical chart. It's going to be your medical chart where you, you, you give this back to God and in humility and meekness, you're going to show evidence of where you trusted him. Where he said, man, I, it's really, really hard for me to extend mercy that way to that person, but I know how much mercy you've given me, so help me. Help me in my weakness, great physician. Help me mold into me. Give me the medicine of the Holy Spirit. Put me into therapy if you have to through your work in my life to, through the big word sanctification. So, so, so I'm extending more mercy towards more different people than me all around me because of how much you've given me. I think it's more like we're us presenting our, our medical record, which is terrible, <laughs> to God going, I, it's a wreck. I know. I'm not healthy. But you're the one. You're the one that makes it healthy. And then when it's all said and done, he, he's, he's going to make it all right. And all the sin that's left in your life 
He's going to just wash it all away. You're going to get a new heavens, new earth, new body, all that stuff. And, and it's just going to be like, man, my, my medical record is, is, is botched. But because of what you did for me on the cross, Jesus, I, I can, man, I, I can't even believe I'm standing before you. Man, do you approach God that way? Do you approach him with that humility? Do you do that? If you do that, then you're getting mercy, and it's going to be a lot easier to extend mercy. If you don't, then you're going to have a hard time with blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. Let me tell you this final story, and there's a picture I want to show you. When we were in Washington, and some of you have, uh, have been here and, and gone through the woods, and the, the trees are ginormous, and it's just beautiful. It's a different kind of beauty. I mean, the, the spruces and the hemlocks and the Douglas firs are ginormous. They're huge. They just they, 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 they block sunlight. And when they're, they're close together, you walk in, it's like almost darkness because of how high they are, how close they are. We went and saw some falls and stuff and did a little bit of hiking to get there. And, and on the way, we noticed pictures of like this. And this is, a, this is one of those pine trees that are ginormous that died for some reason, and it fell over. And the death of that, that tree laying above the ferns on the ground and the moist so, the soil underneath is so rich for growth for things, but there isn't much sunlight, so they're deprived of, of everything photosynthesis will do for that tree. So what do they do? Where do they get the nutrients from? Well, they get it from the other dead trees. So the, the tree, over time, will, will wrap up around the dead tree to get the nutrients right there out of that dead tree, so it brings life. It's amazing. It's amazing. I don't know when this happened, if this happened after the fall, before the fall. I don't know. Because, like, you know, death, all this stuff. I don't know. I don't know. There's people smarter than me trying to figure that stuff out. I don't know. But I do know this, that God set this up. And I think it's this huge metaphor for, man, some of you get it. The death of Christ brings life to us. The death of Christ provides so much mercy for us, it's unbelievable. And that we, 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 based on his death, we can grow up from. Now, the good news is, is he's alive. But it's through his death that brings that mercy to us that we can live off of and get nutrients from and, and grow up from and, and all that. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. Isn't that amazing? So if you fully get that mercy, then you're going to be able to extend it to other people. So we just blow by these beatitudes and just fly on by them, and, and you don't catch how radical Jesus' words are to these disciples who want to follow him now. Totally counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to us too, probably. But if you understand his mercy, then you're going to be able to extend it to other people. We're going to transition into communion. I want to invite those who are serving to come on forward. It's perfect because, man, the center of the gospel, as I said earlier, of Jesus Christ is mercy and grace. You know, not getting what you deserve and getting what you don't deserve. It's unbelievable. You get both sides of the same coin. I mean, you, 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 you know, you didn't, you, it, it's one thing to go, you're not going to go to hell, but then where are you? It's a whole other thing to go, you're not going to go to hell, you're going to go to heaven. Oh, mercy and grace together. Unbelievable gift. And so we celebrate, we remember Jesus, his, his life, death, resurrection. We, we remember him dying for us, taking our place, being broken for you dying so that we could have life. It's, it's, what, it's unbelievable. So don't go through the motions this morning as you come forward. Don't do that. Don't do it out of duty. Just, just sort of check your own heart, your own mind. Think about that mercy and grace. And, and then hey, whenever you're ready, when we do this song, you're welcome to come forward. Just to keep it organized, please come down this aisle, if you would, and go back up this aisle. And then that'll, that means some of you on this side are going to have to go all the way around. Um, but that'll just keep it, keep it flowing so you're not going up against traffic and stuff. But if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you to come. Doesn't matter if you're a part of our church or not. You're, you're invited to partake of, of this right now. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. It's just amazing to push pause for just a minute and think about mercy. And we didn't deserve it. Nobody on the planet deserves any kind of mercy because we've fallen so short of you. Even with the tiniest sin, the tiniest thought, the tiniest bad motive, even knowing the things we ought to do and we don't do them, that, that's against you. And we need your mercy every single day. I'm so grateful Lamentations was written so that we could be reminded that we need it every single day. So again, we, just, we receive your mercy today. 
Thank you for giving it to us. And then help us to extend it to others. We love you. Thank you for breaking your body for us. Thank you for shedding your blood for us so that we could have life to the full. In Jesus' name.